Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Um, I am a botanist, and um, sometimes people have to think hard to figure out how many botanists they actually know. And, um, but I'm, I like to think of myself as a botanist. And uh, we do a lot of good things, I think, over at the university in the herbarium, which has been there since 1907, more or less. And um, I, I wish I could invite you all to come over, but I can't because we don't have a lot of um, visiting space. But every now and then, we'll have uh, visitors come in for a, a little tour. Uh, meanwhile, we do have a, a website, and um, you can find out more about us by going there, and I would show you what the website is. I could give you a bumper sticker, though. Let me just find them <laughs> right here. Yeah, and I don't have one for everybody, but if you'd like one, see what it, see what it says. See what it says? <laughs> it's not his burial. <laughs> it is it's not his fair So, yeah, you know. Take one of these, um, you know, it was International Women's Day the other day, and there was almost a million of us in the world wanting one of these things. So, um, if we run out here, I can get you one of the herbarium. Now, I'll just tell you real fast that the, uh, the herbarium is, because a lot of people ask me, um, what's, what the heck is an herbarium? They come to the herbarium and I think it's the arboretum or they go to the arboretum and they think it's the, that's the herbarium. Or, so an herbarium is a collection of dried and pressed plants, no living plants. Don't do any gardening there. But we have uh, representative specimens of uh, vascular, vascular plants as well as mosses and um, uh, bryophytes and algae. So a very, very scientific place, but of course there's a lot of sort of art inherent in those scientific objects. Okay, so what we're going to do today is a uh, botanist perspective on art. And uh, the other day, my uh, class, taxonomy class, they were like getting a little bit boisterous and they started thinking, Dr. Nelson, how do you know when one species stops and you start getting another species? And I said, well, that's what taxonomy is all about. I said, in fact, it would be fun to have a discussion on what a species is, which should be part of, a, I think, a botany class in college. And then it made me think, what if we just expand that and start talking about art? Like, what is art? But let's do that a different day. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, imaging uh, Cunningham, and I get my notes here. <laughs> Not to worry. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> Imogene Cunningham, there are her dates. Uh, this is all a, a sort of a study of the floristic aspect of her exhibit that she's got here at the museum. And uh, she was one of the, said, she's said to be one of America's quintessential woman photographers. And um, her stuff is uh, widely known. Her uh, actual artistic work spanned about 70 years of her life. And she is known as a very, very eclectic photographer. Uh, lots of different kinds of subjects. And we'll talk a little bit about sort of the trends and uh, what what she was photographing um, during her tenure as a photographer. So what she was mostly interested in, of course, uh, were people. And she was primarily a portrait photographer. Um, she, at the same time, though, she liked a very offbeat, oddball, sort of unusual uh, subject. So many of her uh, images are of oddball sorts of subjects, but um, there are a lot of uh, sort of mainline subjects as well as, as you would expect. Um, one of the things that she uh, likes, liked to say to people was that she was one of those people that liked to see beauty in just about everything, even if it wasn't very pretty on the surface. And um, it's 
maybe sort of telling that she didn't want to take too many pictures of very, very common subjects. And as far as the plant life goes, she apparently never took a single picture of a rose. So roses are common, I guess. So a uh, little bit about her background, if you haven't read it, um, involved with the exhibit. 1903, she was, um, she, well, in 1883, I'm getting this wrong. 1903 to 1907, she was a student at the University of Washington, where she studied a good many things. I don't think she had a single major, um, but she was studying German as well as um, art and photography. 1909, she spent a year in Dresden at the um, Tech, uh, Das Technische Hochschule uh, studying photography. So that's where she got a lot of her, her, um, her background in uh, uh, photography. And then when she came back to the United States, it was to Seattle, uh, and she was like wielding her her forces at that time in Seattle. She became a sort of a, um, a not so much a protege, but she hung out with uh, a number of other artists, uh, photographers at the time, including uh, Steiglitz and uh, Edward Weston. Uh, and of course, Man Ray, she got to be very fond of his work. And um, it's so, sort of suggested that she was uh, not only good at making pictures of standard things like portraits and landscapes, but wacky stuff as well. And um, it's easy to see that in some of her work. Um, in 1915, she uh, married a man named Roy Partridge, R O I. So the Partridge family was started. And um, they uh, moved to San Francisco where they lived for a while. Now, the, and the Partridge family uh, eventually uh, ended up with um, Mr. and Mrs. as well as three kids, three boys. Um, the first uh, son named was named uh, Griffith, which is a, a sort of an odd name. I'm gonna spell it for you, G R Y. F F Y D, Griffid. And you see, like kids with unusual names every now and then. But the other two uh, kids were twins, so they had three boys. And um, Roy and Imogene were very fond of doing things like packing the car up and driving up in the mountains, taking their clothes off and taking pictures of each other, and as well as other stuff, of course. So it was a. They were kind of you know, out there, and a lot of people referred to them as uh, sort of bohemians, and um, that figured into their philosophy, I think, of art as well. Uh, Roy and Imogene were photographers uh, for some time. Um, let's see now. I haven't said anything about plants yet. Uh, as I said, that um, Imogene was primarily interested in um, portraits, there's a whole bunch of things we could talk about that is the 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 philosophy of portraits and uh, ph photographic portraits uh, as opposed to graphic art portraits. Now, I'm not an artist, of course, so it's okay if I say these crazy things up here because you all can, like, humor me for saying things. You know, one of these things that made me think was uh, George Bernard Shaw railed and railed against... Um, graphic representation in portraits that he f considered the only way that you can have a portrait of somebody is with a photograph. That is, a, only a camera will work. And his idea was that a, cam a camera is very objective, whereas an artist who's painting a portrait is going to uh, end up putting all sorts of subjectivity into it. He actually referred to, to that uh, brand of portraiture as monstrous which is a, a bit of a slam, I think. But I, I think it's sort of interesting. Then we got into a discussion back at the herbarium about this business of having, what's the best way to illustrate um, things, including plants. And um, Mara, let me introduce Mara Flannery, who is, I know she didn't want me to, but she's doing a study on this right now, and you might want to meet her later. Yay, way to go, Mara. Anyway. Mara's working on a project involving this very thing, so um, be on the lookout for Mara Flannery. Okay, I'll, I'll quit embarrassing you now. 
Um, uh, she was interested in making pictures of people, and a lot of her work ended up at, uh, in Vanity Fair, so she was making quite a name for herself. And um, this involved a lot of portraits of celebrities, and being in California, she had some uh, connections with Hollywood, so she was doing uh, pictures of some pretty famous people. And it's uh, real interesting, I think, that Joan Blondell and um, James Cagney these, both of these portraits are about 1933. It's real interesting. I just watched, got finished watching a movie with both of them from 1933 called, um, called, um, it was a one and they were the, goodness gracious, they were all swimming in a pool and making designs and never mind. <laughs> Footlight Parade. Footlight Parade, 1933. Anyway, uh, the other person there is um, uh, um, Mom. I don't know how she got a hold of him, but William Somerset Mom. Uh, we also have to remind ourselves that, um, oh, and then finally, this is one of her, her most famous uh, images that um, is featured in the exhibit of uh, Frida Kahlo. Um, other um, woman photographers were around at the time that she had a number of contemporaries, including Ruth Harriet Louise, on the left her image of Greta Garbo, and then um, Laura Irwin was pretty famous for doing uh, stills and uh, landscapes in uh, New Mexico, Taos. Um, her later work, though, uh, later work of Cunningham's um, she would sort of changed our philosophy a bit, and she was moving from studying or, or recording what she called external symbolism to intrinsic symbolism. I'm not really sure what that means exactly, but she found a very good uh, source for studying intrinsic symbolism and looking at vegetation. So she got very interested in plant life, and although she confessed that she didn't know too much about plants, she got really interested in um, different kinds of plants. She also admitted that for a time there, she thought that every succulent plant was a cactus. And it wasn't until later that she found out that that's not true, but that every cactus is a succulent, that kind of thing. So, so she was um, a, a, a big um, supporter of uh, succulent plants in her work. Um, the, the idea of this intrinsic symbolism in hers uh, involves, I think, a number of different concepts that are really come out in plants when they're studied, uh, especially uh, birth, death, sprouting, regrowth, that kind of thing. Uh, easy to see in plants. Renewal, you know, the spring comes, plants come up. So uh, she got very, very interested in looking at plants. So that's what we're going to talk about um, now, I think. Yes. Uh, I put together sort of a, a collage of uh, a number of the plants that are featured in the exhibit. And since I'm the botanist, we're supposed to talk about them. And um, so let's do it. The one on the, um, we'll just talk about these from upper left to lower right. So the one on the upper left is a study of of um, agave, and this is the century plant that you all see around town, the same plant. We had one on campus last year that had to be sawed down because it was sprouting, you know, it was getting ready to <clears throat> go into fruit after blooming and they were afraid it was gonna fall on, fall on some students. So the, <laughs> oh yeah, so it was a beautiful thing, but it was starting to lean over so the, um, the grounds people came over with a, a truck and uh, we found out about it. We came over with our plant presses to make specimens of it and we got the nice gentleman to saw it down, saw that thing down with a, a chainsaw. Oh, you should have seen it. All the, all the children were like arranged around watching the sawdust flying everywhere. It was great. The sawdust, the, the crumbs of the plant sawdust, I mean, it was wet, ended up all over him, like his arms, you know, 
And um, then the, the botanists were so thrilled that he had cut up little sections that we could use to press and make nice little specimens of. And he started doing this. You know, and it got, you know, he's doing this. And after a while he says, something's wrong. And he had to go home and get all cleaned off. And it was terrible. I felt a little bit bad about making him do that. But otherwise they would have just hauled it away and thrown it in a, thrown it in the river or something. Just kidding. But anyway, she was uh, really interested, as I said, in succulents, and agave is definitely a succulent plant. It's a member of the, what we botanists now put in the agavaceae, the family agavaceae, uh, after being removed from the lily family. So agave, and of course, what these things are <coughs> in the, um, in the, um, oh look, there's the, That's the, uh, those are just the, uh, le the um, tips of individual leaves that she'd cut off and put into a container. So that's what's going on there. <clears throat> okay, um, the next plant is also one of her favorites and a favorite of many photographers. And of, of course we move into a, um, a different monocot family, but the wonderful, wonderful world of the aeroids, the family Aeraceae, which she was fond of. And this particular plant is called, I think it's called calla lily. If you ever deal with me too much, you'll find out that I don't do plant common names much because I'm a taxonomist, so I deal with the scientific names. It drives some people crazy. But um, So for me, this plant is um, Xantadeshia. Ethiopica, but for most people it's just calla lily, and so one that you'll see in the in the florist. Um, sometimes it's easy to grow, um, not for me. But this is also something of a weed in California, so it would have been real easy for her to pick up on this stuff, sort of on the rocky coastline of um, Marin County, that kind of thing. So what goes on with the aeroids, the Aeraceae, and now a lot of you all are into native species, I know. And there are some native aeroids that we've got, such as um, Jack, or, um, Jack in the Pulpit, that sort of thing, and a green dragon. Well, those are, honestly goodness, members of this family. And the flowering situation is always the variation on <clears throat> a certain theme. <clears throat> so in this theme, there's a stalk here. And up at the top of it, a lot of people want that to be a, a petal or something. No, this plant doesn't have any petals. And, it, you know, my students find out stuff like that. I say, a dandelion, that's not one flower. It's about 200 flowers that you're holding. And, I, you know, their whole botanical framework of life has come crashing down when you find out something like that. But, no, this is not a, um, a petal. That thing is what we call a bract. So it's a whitened bract. Sometimes it will be pink. You'll see this also if you get... Um, or caladium kind of things, or um, they they grow in the shade on people's patios, and they they'll have one of these things, or even a, a philodendron. When you see the elephant ear, same thing. So that the bract is called a spathe, and the flowers are actually really tiny and not showy at all, and they'll be um, embedded on a, a thick, fleshy spike that's on the inside of that spathe. Now, Cunningham didn't, you know, I don't think she was paying any attention to that. She was just looking at the form and the, I don't know, the intrinsic symbolism of, of, of that. Um, so, uh, calla lily xantadeshia. Okay. The next image uh, was entitled Chris. I'm not really sure who Chris was, but here she was playing around with... Um, superposing an image of a what appears to be a cleared leaf that is cleared so that we're looking at the veins maybe it's just a negative i don't know how, i don't have any idea how she did this but she put him in the background and it looks pretty spooky to me and um i'm not really sure what this um leaf is as far as we're going to get nitpicking on what each one of these plants is 
I think it's probably a species of poplar because she does use this technique in a number of other images. So maybe she had one left over. I think it's sort of funny or interesting or something or intrinsically symbolic that, um, uh -oh. Oh. that she, she didn't mind putting that bug hole in the leaf, that she didn't want to use a perfect leaf, which to me is sort of goes along with her, her, her concept of using the wacky stuff. It doesn't have to be perfect. So, um, of course, poplars, we have poplars around here that are, have similar kinds of leaves, obviously, uh, starting to bloom now. And um, one of them is, one of these poplars is called cottonwood. We have two species of cottonwood that are both in the genus. Um, are one of them, one of the other ones ne relative, related to it is platinous, but the, um, the cottonwoods are in the willow family. So eastern cottonwood and uh, swamp cottonwood. Very, very similar trees around here. Okay, down, on the, down here in the lower left is a, um, a, a plant that she was obviously interested in. Uh, no flowers uh, depicted here, but these are the upcoming new uh, leaves of a hell, uh, what the mountain people call um, elber or hellebore. And so this is a plant that's in the um, lily family um, and it's extremely toxic. So there are species in California that grow wild and this is pretty obviously where she got her um, plants. I'm not sure if she was doing this outdoors or more likely bringing them into the studio to take pictures of. So um, yeah in the lily family. So on the bottom in the middle is a sort of a, a big view of trees. These were uh, a forest in France. And um, I'm not really sure when she was doing this work, but this is sort of a negative, I guess, of a bunch of conifers. I'm not really sure, like I said, what, which ones they are, but possibly a larch. But conifers. Wow. A similar uh, kind of conifer would be the one on the lower right, and uh, this is just a pine. Now, it's a very, um, you know, very stark, black and white, lots of contrast going on, and um, I don't know what else to say about it. I'm not really sure what kind of pine it is, but California has a number of different pines that are native, and she must have like done the same thing either in, I would expect, in the studio for that one. Okay, any questions about these or comments or these images? Flora, yes, sir. Maybe because she was she continue to take pictures of people even into her, her, her last years. But it's interesting, this business of portraits, one wonders about the, the aspect of having a, uh, sometimes people want their picture taken, want their, port their willing subjects for a portrait. Sometimes people don't want their picture taken, and they're st still a portrait, right? So this notion of willing versus unwilling participants, and then Maybe she was starting to think that, well, the plants don't care one way or the other. They're neither willing nor unwilling, so you're very safe with plants. Maybe that's true, I guess so. All right, let's look at some more. Oh, I got the pine tree on here twice, sorry. Um, but that leads us to the next one on the right, which is, um, I think it's a beautiful composition of, of foliage, and this was called uh, philodendron. And of course, um, everybody knows what philodendron means, right? It means a tree lover, right? Which is what this genus, this big genus of plants likes to do, climb up trees. So these things um, have been known in the United States and Europe f for hundreds of years as cultivated plants. Um, and this particular one 
you see these kind of wacky looking holes in the leaves. I'm sure you've seen these things in your doctor's office or someplace where they're growing in the corner. Um, uh, like I said, a lot of different species of philodendron, um, they're very interesting plants. They also, being aeroids, have a flower characteristics that are similar to what we saw with the calla lily. Um, no flowers to see here, only the leaves. And these, this business of having the leaves slit down the middle from the edge and then having these holes, I love it, the little holes there. Those are not bug holes, those are naturally produced and it's a little bit complicated the way they do that while the leaf is unrolling itself and the cell divisions that are involved with producing that leaf allow for these slits to develop as well as the holes. And of course, botanists don't just want to call them holes. We, we call them <laughs> fenestrations, of course, which is a really cool word. Fenestra, I think that means window. And then the Germans have a good word for it. Fenster, right? Never mind all that, you know. The temperatures that, the cold temperatures that we get here in Columbia? If you leave this outside, it'll die okay. right after fall. It's very sensitive. Okay. So, I mean, there may be some places where you can grow them outside. No, I just, I'm from Florida. Florida, oh my yes. Oh, gosh, they could kill a tree. <laughs> Florida, yeah. Um, now we do see elephant ears growing around here outside and they seem to be able to handle our winters just fine. But as far as I know, <clears throat> these are more like house plants, at least in the winter. <coughs> I gotta tell you the bad news though, it's fun to call this a philodendron, but we taxonomists don't allow that anymore. No, the, this species and its relatives go into the genus Monstera. So keep that in mind when you go to Lowe's and you see this label is philodendron. It's not true. <laughs> but that's like one, one thing that happens with um, <laughs> once the taxonomists get loose. Okay, um, and the, the bottom on the left is a, well, it's an upside down bulb with the roots on it. So this is pretty cool, you know, a, a bulb with roots and it speaks to the um, the spring-like erupting of life from a place you wouldn't expect it or something, something. Um, but anyway, she liked to look at different parts of plants and obviously uh, the lower, the parts of the plants that are usually underground are perfectly fair game for photography too. So I'm not really sure which what this is. It looks like it might be some sort of a tulip, but without the top, even a trained taxonomist is gonna have problems. Okay, and on the right, we have a, another uh, succulent plant. And this is, it looks to me like very, very starry sort of constellation effect of all these little rosettes of a succulent plant that's called, you may know it as hens and chickens or hens and chicks. And this is a succulent that's in the sedum family. In fact, um, it's real common, easy to grow. Even I can grow it. And uh, these are just, all of this is vegetative. No flowers on any of these pictures. So you don't have to have flowers to make good plant pictures. Okay. Um, uh, this is my last slide. And this is maybe the most interesting. Uh, these two pictures. Um, the magnolia on the left is, sure enough, our native magnolia grandiflora, which is native absolutely along our coast. I think it barely gets into North Carolina, but it goes surely all the way down to South Florida and then over to Texas, that kind of thing. Um, but this is a native plant that I just want to talk a little bit about Magnolia. It's called Southern Magnolia or Bull Bay Magnolia. I think it's the state f f state tree of Alabama or is it anybody from or Mississippi? And um, 
And what a wonderful, wonderful plant. The botanists like to refer to this as a primitive flower in that it seems to um, have a lot of features that would have been associated with um, some of the first derived flowers from the Cretaceous. Uh, with, a, with whorls of parts, and you see, in a, next time you look at a magnolia, you know, these, most people just want to call them petals, and I guess that's a pretty good term, but the problem is with this kind of flower, these, uh, this spiral of parts uh, is very um, slowly graduated from the bottom to the top. That is, from down here at the bottom of the flower up towards the apex of the flower. And we got to remember that all a flower is, this sounds pretty disappointing, is a modified stem tip with specialized parts. <laughs> so what's happening is that with a lot of the flowers that you go outside and you pick a flower and you look at it, not a dandelion, of course, you're going to see these flower parts, sepals on the bottom of the flower. You've heard of these, I think and then petals, and then all the other goodies like stamens and pistils. Well, with uh, this kind of flower, the sepals and the petals are not very well uh, differentiated. So a lot of times these, um, these, we can call them petals, but a lot of botanists would call them tepals. I'm not making it up. Not sepals and not petals, but tepals, spelled T-E-P-A-L-S. <clears throat> just uh, referring to uh, the situation with some of these, uh, what we call um, uh, basal dicots, uh, primitive um, flowers. So the rest of this, this flower, you'll know this from your first botany class, is a, a spiral, a very tight spiral here of stamens. Oh, and it's wonderful. You look at these stamens and you get the idea that there's the most bottomless stamen right there. And then that, you know, they spiral around, round and round, round and round, round and round. And as they spiral around this, this receptacle, their shape changes. In fact, that lowest one there looks a little bit like one of these petals. So you can see that the filament, see right there, is broadened. So it's like a stamen that sort of wants to be a petal. Or is it a petal that sort of wants to be a stamen? So with these primitive flowers, and especially the ones that exhibit the spiral, it's, um, this is a common occurrence. This is even better expressed in something like <clears throat> a water lily, if you um, check out the water lilies in the pond, and you'll see the same kind of thing going on. Um, so, uh, and of course, everything else, the uh, male part of the flower, this, the stamens, the male part of the flower, Greek word, andresium, what a great word. I asked my students, and they, and they said, I said, what does andresium mean? And I said, it means man's house. So, you know, andro, and then actually the word for ecology gives us the suffix of that, that word, esium. So, the man's house. And what a clever way to refer to all the stamens of a flower, andresium. Well, what are we going to call the rest of it? <laughs> If those are all the <clears throat> female parts of the flower, we'll call all of that kind of wiggly looking stuff the gynecium. And of course, each one of those individual hook-like things is a single pistil. So not only does it have a whole, whole bunch of stamens, it has a whole bunch of pistils on the same flower. Not all flowers do that, only the really primitive ones do that. So magnolia is a really good example. And I know Cunningham wasn't really thinking of this, but I'm so glad that she did this. this. This magnolia image has appeared in a number of botany textbooks, sure enough. It's one of the, I think, uh, best illustrations of blooming magnolia I've ever seen. And she got this when it had first opened. This is a, another aspect of the biology of the plant, is that the first day that the flower is opened, the um, the pistils, they're ready to go. They're ready to receive pollen. But the stamens are not. It's like they're still in puberty or something. But the, st the pistils are active female parts of the flower. So we call this, this kind of flower, this great, protogenous, or protogenous. That is, 
the, female, the, the flower opens up as a female. The next day, it opens up again. They close a little bit at night. The next day, the stamens are going to town, but the females aren't working. So now it's um, a male, you know, it goes from being male, it's basically a hermaphroditic flower. It goes from being a female, functionally female flower. The next day, over some time, you know, 24 hours kind of thing, to be in a male flower, producing lots of pollen, but the little critters are flying off to another flower and pollinating a day one flower. You see how it all works. So it gets to be kind of complicated, and um, but it's just fascinating stuff. So pro protandry would be the alternative when the when the male when the flowers functionally staminate or male when it first opens up. And, and obviously, it, in, it ensures cross-pollination, which is a good thing for a lot of plants. Okay, so the magnolia, as I said, that's one of her most well-known images, I think. And then the last one uh, that I've saved for last, uh, uh, again, we get to talk a little bit about the philodendron family, um, the aeroids. And this plant is a, um, an honest-to-goodness member of that family. It's growing in my backyard. Well, not this one. But this is a plant called, sometimes it's called voodoo lily. It's got a terrible name, and it does look kind of creepy. But um, it's got this one single leaf that has this oddball sort of uh, way of dividing itself. They're not exactly leaf leaflets, but they're divisions of a single leaf. And then when this thing gets finished, uh, leafing out, the leaf only stays there for a couple of weeks before it'll just basically dissolve and like rot, fall on the ground. Then it will send up a blooming stalk. Wow. Now the blooming stalk is where the plant actually gets its name voodoo lily because it's really disgusting. And it makes a, 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 one of those bracts. I know you're, you know what I'm, what I'm talking about. It makes one of those bracts, a spathe, with a spadix, so the spike is on the inside. Now in this case, the whole thing is sort of colored um, purple and brown and with speckles and spots all over it, and it smells like a dead rat or that kind of thing. So guess what would pollinate something like this plant? Flies. And uh, you know, commonly in the spring when our plant comes up, just that single bloom, flies are all over it. And of course, the dogs get a little bit, you know, moderately interested in it as well. They're always interested in smelling interesting things too. So, um, but she put her hand, I think this is her own hand. And I think this um, sort of suggests, um, I'm being silly here, but I'm gonna say that this, this image evokes not, uh, not only intrinsic symbolism of the plant, but extrinsic symbolism of her hand. And it was one of the last pictures that she um, put together. And I think it's uh, really meant to speak to as a sort of a plaintive, I don't know, I don't know what it means. It's, it suggests death to me. What do you think? The hand is divided into, yeah, that's a, comes out of a bud that grows and generates all the bones and muscles as it grows outward and then, you know, get five, five tentacles. And then, and then whatever it's attached to dies and rots. So. <laughs> so, um, folks, my time is up and I've basically told you what I, what I know to tell you about Imogene Cunningham. I have not seen the exhibit myself yet, but I'm going to. Uh, there are a good many other references to her art um, that you might check out in a library someplace, maybe at, at, up the, down the street, a couple of blocks, or at Thomas Cooper. Uh, there was one of her biographers was named Lawrence, L-O-R-E-N-Z. And he was um, especially fond of um, compiling her, her artwork. So any other questions or like 
violent disagreements or anything. All right, now remember, we got these up here while they last. And um, I'd be happy to speak to uh, any of you about plants or any of this sort of thing. But um, I think I'm going to turn it back over to Kaylee if she's, she's going to like give us a benediction or something. So, thank you.